Well, good morning. I'm hoping I got my microphone doing its thing. And it is great to see everybody today. Can I get a hallelujah? I know everybody can't be back, and I know the snow's on the ground, and it seems a little different, but we get to be back again, and uh, we celebrate this day. Would you just give a pause for a moment here and join with me as we begin our time of worship together today? Let's pray and talk with God. Gracious and loving God, we give thanks that here in this place we have opportunity to gather once again to worship and celebrate. Things have just been crazy. And you know that. You have watched over us and been the anchor in our lives throughout this long period. Through the questions and the wondering and the sickness and the isolation, you have never forsaken us. You have never left us. You have been present with us throughout this journey. And we have sought as much as we could to be your people. As we gather today once again, both in person as well as online and by phone, we give thanks. that The opportunities have been given to us to gather again as the people of God. We give thanks this day and invite your presence with us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. It is so good to see everyone here today. And while we are spread apart and while we have had so much go on, it is so good to see you all at this time. There's been a number of things happening, and I know we've got announcements that are uh, on the screen, as well as when you open up the worship guide, you'll see our mini link, our, our weekly newspaper advertising all the things that have been happening and are happening, as well as our connection card. I invite you to fill that out as well. There are some announcements that uh, I want to make sure that you hear from me as we come together again. Um, one of those that I want to start with is more of a pastoral note. And as I've expressed, and it's on our webpage, and I've tried to share with as many folks as possible, we know that as we gather together today as, as the church, we're not all of one mind. And I think that's the nicest way to say that, that as we come back together again, there are members of our congregation that are concerned that we're gathering once again. And so I want to let you be aware of some of the things that we've done. First and foremost, we're continuing to practice our, our physical distancing, not social. We can still holler at each other and, and wave hands and, and bump elbows and do all that. But we're going to seek to do our six feet apart and we're going to continue to wear a mask as we do that. We've also got in uh, gotten. Well, there's my Southern coming out right there, isn't it? So we, we have purchased um, HEPA air filters so that we can um, purify the air in here. They've been running for the last three days and if it makes you feel better. It's been running green since the moment I turned the thing on. So it's been cleaning the air and it's going to continue to do that. We've got fans moving air um, outside of here. So we're making certain that the air in here is clean and that we're being attentive to all of the best guidelines that we can have. And as I've said over and over again, please, 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 if you do not feel safe at any time or you come or you're preparing to come and you feel under the weather and may have some symptoms of sickness, please stay home and know that we will be streaming live on Facebook. The sermon by phone is going to continue to be done and on the first of the week, I will take the Facebook um, video live streaming and we'll put that up on our YouTube page. So that will be available indefinitely into the future. So we'll be able to record that and put that out there. So we're doing all that we can to, to keep our hybrid worship going. Um, are you? you are. I, I should be, but we need to turn me up a little bit. I'll turn you up. I'm okay. <laughs> Do I need to just speak up more? Is, okay. Um, so 
I wanted to make sure that you were aware of those things. And we've also, um, Tanya's back, Tanya's back. I'll make sure I pronounce her name right. Tanya, is that right? Tanya, who has been doing our child care for many years, is back in child care is now available again as well on Sunday morning. So we're excited to have that as well. Today is a day that we will recognize all saints today. In addition to that, um, Veterans Day is this week. And so um, I just want to give a moment and a pause. Uh, if you have been a veteran of our armed forces, would you just stand up for a moment? I don't know who all has, has done that and served, but thank you all for doing that. Thank you for your service. And we thank you, absolutely. And uh, I know there are others online as well, and we thank you for your time and your gifts to our nation. Uh, we have a lot, as you can see. This is, I, I didn't realize there was a season in Alaska for auctions, but if there is one, it's November. <laughs> and, uh, and, whoa, there we go. You found me. There it is. Okay. So um, one of the auctions that's not listed in here that I want you to be aware of and folks to be aware of is our Birchwood camp actually will be getting an auction tomorrow. So if uh, you have supported and have a heart for our Birchwood camp, um, they are doing their auction beginning tomorrow. We have more auctions beginning and those are listed um, today uh, in our mini link. Okay, Whew. I think that's got everything that I need to add to our list today. And so without further ado, I want to invite Ken to come forward this morning, who is our lay reader and uh, leading us in Psalm 24. I invite you to stand as you are able for our time of responsive reading from Psalm 24 this day. This on? Yep. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is from Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and all the fullness thereof. The world and those who dwell therein. For God has founded it upon the seas. And established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in God's holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts. Who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully. They will receive blessings from the Lord and vindication from the God of their salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek the Lord, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the ruler of glory may come in. Who is the ruler of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors. Who is the ruler of glory may come in? Who is this ruler of glory? The Lord of hosts. The Lord is the ruler of glory. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. One thing I didn't mention was that as part of our guidelines, we are continuing to hold to the guidelines of not having congregational singing. So in order to do that, we're trying to be creative with that. We will be having our anthem today, and I want to thank you and invite you as well. That the anthem will play following um, the sermon, and that is a partnership that we have with St. John. If you're interested in Miss Singing in Choir, it's a way for you to be a part of that, and I want to continually thank those of you that have been able to participate in that. We are working, and um, as we move forward, Sandra's been looking at the opportunities as well um, for the ways in which we can be uh, more attentive to that and being able to provide um, song into the future. So without further ado, though, I want to open our time together today with our sermon and the beginning of a new series as we gather together today. This is three more simple rules, and I'll explain that in a little bit more detail as we kind of go forward. You may have heard about our, our Methodist 
rules that we have that John Wesley gave us so many years ago, and it's kind of a spin on that a little bit. But today I want to start by just giving pause for a second, because I imagine some of you in here, like me, you remember the story of Aladdin, and if you've had kids or grandkids and know a few, maybe you just love going to Disney movies, you've probably seen Aladdin. And for those of us, some of us grew up with it before there was ever Disney, and we just read it in Arabian Nights. And I don't know if you knew this or not, or, or remember, Aladdin's genie gave three rules as well. Does anybody remember what they are? I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put it out there first. Does anybody remember one of the three rules that the genie gave? You can't wish for another wish. You can't wish. Actually, that was a given. He said that was an unspoken, but that's a good one. I'm going to give you credit for it. At least you get a half point for that one. That you can't laugh. You couldn't. You couldn't wish for unlimited wishes. Did I see another hand in the back? You, can't bring anybody back from the dead. you cannot bring anybody back from the dead. That's one of them. Very good. All right. So there's two more. No looking on Google, by the way. You can't do that. All right. So we've kind of really got, we got. I'm guessing, but you can't harm another person. Uh, yeah, well, I'm going to give you that one. You can't kill anybody. So I think that's that good. That's fit. We'll, we'll say that one. All right, so that's two of them. One more. Bingo! There it is. So those were the rules. Good job. Yes. All right. I'm proud of this congregation. That's awesome. Yeah, so the, the genie gave the rules and the guidance. Now, in the Bible, there's a similar thing that happens, but thankfully God is no genie and Solomon was not Aladdin. But we have a very similar conversation in a dream between God and the son of King David, Solomon, who was taking the throne. Let me share with you the words that come from that passage from 1 Kings 3. The king went up to Gibeon. To offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, you've shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You've continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on this throne this very day. Now, Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father, David. But I'm only a little child and I do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people that you have chosen. A great people, too numerous, numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administrating justice, I will do what you have asked and I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never be anyone like you nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. Solomon could have picked anything. He could have picked and chosen anything, but he chose wisdom. And God was so pleased that he indicated to Solomon that he would even give him what he didn't ask for. It's almost like by asking for wisdom that he got everything else. Hmm. Isn't it interesting how wisdom, I like the little sound effects that I was getting there too. That was good, good timing. Oh, it's almost like wisdom creates this direct result. The wealth and the honor, and everything that came after that. And that's what I think when we talk about the other three rules that John Wesley gave, particularly on the subject of stewardship, he was talking about things that had to do with wisdom. Now, at this point, 
I think it is a way of wisdom that we're called to. And if you understand something about John Wesley, is John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, the Methodist movement and the revival, was someone that loved learning. He consumed books. And if you've ever seen the, the logo for Cokesbury Bookstore, it's, it's a logo of John Wesley on horseback, not riding along or trotting along. He's riding on horseback reading books. He did it everywhere. He actually was trusting his horse to take him to the right places sometimes. Some of the stories, if you read in his journals, he gets off track a little bit because he gets so engrossed to learning and growing that wisdom was something that Wesley saw was incredibly important. So much so that as he was trying to raise up pastors within the movement of lay speakers, that he worked very diligently to provide for them guidance in writing their own sermons. And he even put together, and it's even still in our book of discipline, and I actually counseled many of my, my kids when I was a youth pastor, when they were being called to ministry, I said, you need to realize that in the book of discipline, it says that the clergy and the church are to read and keep on their shelves Wesley's 52 standard sermons and his notes on the New Testament, that they are to refer to those so that we might preach and teach what is consistent with what Wesley instructed us. And in one of those sermons was called On the Use of Money. And in there, he had three simple rules. Now, You've heard probably the three simple rules of do no harm, do good, stay in love with God, or keep to the guidelines of God. But Wesley had three additional simple rules. And I want to go through those over these next three weeks as we talk about stewardship and how we approach it. Because Wesley, like Jesus, saw it as incredibly important that we handle money in the right way. There's a lot of things that could be said about money when it comes to the church. Uh, there's a meme that went out this last week. If if it's a, if money's such a bad thing, then why is the church always asking for it? Hmm. Well, to understand it, it's the root. The root of, of evil, in part, is the love of money. It's not money itself. And that's John Wesley understood that. And we're going to look at that in another scripture passage where John said, in his rules on the use of money, earn all you can, save all you can, so you might give all you can. Ponder that and think about that for just a moment. Because I want to delve into one of those parables of Jesus that kind of stumps us. I suspect it probably has you in the past as well. It comes from Luke chapter 16. And in this parable, Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what's this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. The manager says to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I will do. So that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 450. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, Take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. Um, sorry, I had my phone going off there for a second. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not 
been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You know, it stumps us, doesn't it? How is it that Jesus commends somebody who is a dishonest manager? Well, one thing I want to sit there and share with you, when you read a Bible and they give titles to sections, don't believe them, okay? <laughs> Those were not in the original text. Those are what modern day translators put there to try to help us. So when you read it's the parable of the dishonest manager, I'm going to put out to you, that's not quite right. And be careful when you do that. So, you know, that's one of the things. So it causes us to kind of go, wow, okay. And in many ways, it's similar to many of the writings of the desert fathers of the early church. The desert fathers and mothers in the first seven centuries of the church would come up with parables in similar ways and make you go, really? That doesn't sound right. Because it's odd to our ears because we don't necessarily have the whole context. But when Wesley read this, he got really clear. He didn't see any problem with it at the very beginning. And I think it's because he understood an aspect of this that we probably have missed. And another commentator was the one that brought to my attention. You see, like tax collectors, many managers, when they worked for somebody, in order to provide a salary for their own living, they would have permission to add a markup in order to make their income. So this owner of the land who had the gallons of olive oil and the wheat, he had this loan out that somebody was supposed to pay 900 gallons, but the manager said, knock it down to 450. Well, that's likely because 350 was intended for the manager. It wasn't that he was sitting there stealing from the owner of the land. It's that he was being shrewd and understood, you know what, I, I can't take away what was owed to my boss, but I can take mine off the top, and that way the person doesn't have to pay the full price. Thereby, as Jesus said, making friends with those that were present so that when he might lose the job and we don't know one way or another because that's really not the point it's that ultimately he was trying to be creative in building his connectional system and when we look at it it's important for us to see he probably worked incredibly hard and wesley was one that realized and understood the importance of that labor and that effort and the work that somebody went into to do this. As one writer and pastor said, Wesley really understood the whole idea of today's uh, mindset and points where, where kids will talk about, and I joke around with my kids about their jobs sometimes. I said, when they get discouraged by having to go to work, I said, go get that bread, man. Wesley understood that. He said, earn all you can. Be productive, but not just in any form. Earn all you can by honest industry, Wesley said. We were made to be productive with purpose. Earn all you can by common sense. Do basic things right. Don't spend more than what you make. Earn all you can without paying more for it than it's worth. Don't sell your soul for a paycheck. I think that's so critically important for us to hear in this day and time. I know that there's a lot of question marks in our society right now that we're hearing about when it relates to what type of economy we should have. But the practices of living life and following through on it as Wesley understood and as Jesus taught was that we ought to be industrious. We are called to be productive. In fact, one of the Desert Fathers I was reading this week just jumped out at me when I was, was doing some time of reflection that said to some of the monks, when you get discouraged by the work that you're doing and you flee from that work, I put on my cloak and I run to where the work is and submit myself 
to the effort that I am to take. That there's a part of the work that we're called to do to be able to direct our body. And we've been called to do that throughout Scripture, that we are to own this body that has been given to us and that we are called to move forward in that way. And I believe Jesus is incredibly clear here. You cannot serve both God and money. It's why we talk about tithing. It's why we talk about stewardship. Money is not the point. It's that nothing gets in the way between us and our relationship with God. Second, your financial life can be a witness to your faith. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that at the offering time. And how trustworthy you are with other people's money is what other people are many times looking at. You know, as a church, it's one of the things that we try to make very conscientious effort to do to make sure that the money that's given on Sunday mornings goes to the things that people give. I joked around, and it really wasn't a joke, it was actually in all seriousness. When you give to the church, what do we do with the money? We spend it. We spend it on the ministries and the work that we believe in, that you believe in. And we seek to be faithful in that. Sometimes people ask us about, why is apportionment so important? What does that even mean? Why do we pay a portion? Well, exactly by dividing that word up, a portion. And it's our giving to help the ministries of the United Methodist Church. Reflecting on, as I've gotten to know you as a congregation, uh, and talking to so many of you that were here in the very early years of Anchor Park, you understand the importance of apportionments. Why? Because this church was founded in part by the giving of other United Methodist churches to make happen a church here in the Airport Heights community. A portion that's made that happen. I was a church planter for a time in Georgia, and so I know exactly how important that is. It's part of our mission giving to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when we look at what we do and how we think about stewardship, we are called to give forth a portion. We are called to earn all we can in right and good ways to further the kingdom of God and to be faithful in all things. And I know, and we've talked about this as church council and on finance, sometimes it's awkward when pastors talk about money. Isn't it? And some of you go, oh man, the pastor's going to talk about money. Oh man, I don't know if I want to hear that. He's just going to keep asking for money. Well, it's not that I'm asking for money. It's that I'm asking for you to be faithful in how you do and handle your money. That's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus was saying in this important parable. That challenged us to earn all we can. Now the next couple weeks we're going to keep unpacking that. What it means to save all we can and to give all we can. But here's the thing. I don't believe we're called to wishful living. We're not called to a life like Aladdin. We're called not to wishful thinking but to faithful living as Solomon did. Let that sink in this day and in the days ahead as we reflect on Wesley's three simple rules on stewardship. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. At this time, I invite you to turn your attention up to our screen as we hear from our choir today as we hear the anthem.
I continue to be very thankful for those of y'all that are part of the choir um, and seeking to provide music for us during these days. If you're interested in that, please um, make note. I think there was something in the mini link about it. But if you don't find a way to sign up, please let me know. Um, shoot me an email and I'd be happy to get you connected with our, our choir as they move forward and work in that way. Today we also want to recognize that it's All Saints Sunday. In this past year, we have lost two very dear people to many of us, Bob Mitchell and Gail Phillips. But I also know that there are other names that have been near and dear to you. And so during our time of prayer, as we go to God in prayer today, I invite you to lift up the names of those saints in your life who have passed on this past year that have been influential. We pray for the Mitchell family and the Phillips family and their loss and our loss. And we want to join with you in those other moments and those places and those people who meant so much to you. Would you join with me? making your place a place of prayer, even as I kneel here on behalf of us all before the throne of praise. Let's talk with God. We humbly come before you, God of grace, God of mercy, God of blessings beyond measure. Solomon understood those things when he came to you, that you were in control of all things, and he understood what he needed from the very beginning. With humility, he prayed for wisdom. As your people, we come to you this day, O oh God, knowing that we too are in need of that wisdom. As we engage and encounter and seek to make a difference in this world, may we live with that same wisdom. May you fill us and indwell us with that wisdom that comes only from your presence with us. As we gather as the people of God, we come humbly this day, thankful once again that we can gather today in worship with one another. We come and we pray for those that are unable to be here, whether by choice or because of their own illnesses, we even pray that you would comfort and be with them. As we come, we pray for the Phillips and the Mitchell family too, for their loss and their grief and what that means for us. We pause this morning now as we remember those two great saints and lift to you those other saints in our lives that have meant so much to us. We give thanks this day for these names and for those others on our hearts this day. For those whose examples have been for us an example of Jesus in our world. Give us discerning hearts that we might learn the lessons that they shared with us, that we might be like them, like Jesus, in a world that needs to see your love, O oh God. We come to you as well with the joys and the concerns of our heart this day. God, we now lift to you those things that we are thankful for and for those that are heavy on our hearts. The homeless as the seasons change. Amen. 
for our families and children. For the Afghan refugees arriving in Haiti. As you hear these concerns on our hearts this day, O oh God, we ask that you would move in only the ways that you can. We pray for those leaders and those that are in positions of authority, that you would guide them that have opportunity and power to make a difference, to lead humble, humbly and caring for those who need to be cared for. Help us to be your church, O oh God, in these days and times, to step forward in the ways that we can show leadership within our community. May we be that light on the hill that so many need to see, that we need to be for one another. God, in all these things, we put our faith and our trust and our hope in you. We come together now and pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we come together today, we have the opportunity to celebrate our meal of Thanksgiving, communion, a chance of symbolizing our faith, but more importantly, it's a ministry of grace that through this meal, God calls us once again back to Jesus. I hope that you were able to get the uh, communion cups with uh, wafers. Um, if you didn't get one, can you raise your hand? Did everybody get one um, this day? I know they're on the back table. Um, Tom will bring some. I think we're good, Tom. I think everybody's got them. As we come together for this meal, we tell again the story. Not, again, some kind of story from Arabian Nights, but a story of history. A story of the night that Jesus was crucified. The night that he gathered together for the last time with his closest and dearest friends in an upper room. And there he took the meal of the Passover, the meal of the promise of the Jewish people, that God would never leave them and forsake them. And he took those unique elements of the meal and provided for us a new one. On that night, he took the bread. He gave thanks and he broke it. And he said to those gathered, take and eat. This is my body, which was given for you. As often as you do this, remember me. Following the breaking of the bread, he took the cup. Then they celebrate with wine. Today we celebrate with grape juice. And he poured it out. And he said to those gathered, Take and drink from this, all of you. This is my blood which has been poured out for you for a new covenant, for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. And so it is that we gather today as the people of God celebrating this meal given to us of the promise. It's one that we tell the story again because we need to hear it, especially on days that we gather together after being apart for so long. And here we come together as the people of God giving thanks that God has not ever left us or forsaken us, but he constantly calls to us. And we call to others. Here in the United Methodist Church, we believe that this is a meal of grace and so our table is an open table all are invited to come Jesus just asked 
that we would turn from the way that we were going and follow after him. So we repent. We turn. We change directions and turn to God. In your worship guide on the back page, you'll find our prayer of confession. And I invite you to join with me as we pray that prayer together, saying, Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will, and we have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to take a moment now to lift your individual confessions to God at this time. Let's pray. Hear the good news. If we will confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Glory to God. Our sins are forgiven. Amen. If you haven't had the opportunity to have communion with these wonderful little cups, I invite you now, I'll kind of guide you through that. There's a clear little plastic that if you'll flip up on that tab that kind of sticks out at an angle, you should be able to peel that back. And there you'll receive uh, the bread, the wafer. Take and eat. Remember God's love for you. And if you'll take the rest of that tab, you can wiggle it a little bit and pull back. Be gentle. Otherwise you'll have grape juice everywhere. And I invite you to drink blood of Jesus given for you for the new covenant. But if you will, just hold on to that for the just foreseeable future. There will be trash cans both at the front of the sanctuary as well as the back for you to be able to dispose of these on your way out today. As we come to this point in the service and we give thanks for the gifts that God has given to us, the gift of His Son, Jesus Christ, and so many things that God has provided, we also come to the time of our service where we remember the offering, our opportunity to give back. One of the things that changed my life um, as, a, as a pastor, but before that as a Christian, was being in my church back in North Carolina, Jarvis Memorial. We were having a concert one night where... A young lady was singing and was sharing with us about an opportunity to be able to give to adopt a child that was starving somewhere in the world. I was 16 years old. I was young and silly and stupid. I didn't know what tithing was. I didn't know what giving was. But she made this in, in just, I don't know, impassioned plea in such a way that I understood and for the first time as a 16-year-old who had a part-time job, I figured, you know what? I could take $18 a month and help feed a kid somewhere in the world. Wow, that's a pretty powerful thing to think about. I didn't really understand all the other ways that the church did ministry, but I couldn't understand that. She put flesh and bone on the idea of tithing and giving. And so for the first time, I made a pledge and a commitment to give $18 a month to adopt a child. His name was Eduardo, and he was a little kid. He was five years old in Rwanda. He was my adopted child for 13 years. Until he turned 18, and he graduated out of the program. He was able to go all the way through high school, the only kid in his family. And during, at that time in the, the late or early 90s, he was part of a, a number of young children that got separated in their family in the, the wars in Rwanda. 
but I got to make a difference. And it taught me how one person could change everything in the life of another. I don't know where Eduardo is when he graduated out of the program. You separate and don't have that contact anymore. But it helped me to understand what giving can do. And when John Wesley said, do no harm and do good, he wasn't saying for somebody else and for us to wait. He was saying, you can do good. And I can tell you that the church at Anchor Park does good. Just this last week, somebody put $2 in the blessing box. Chris came to me, our administrative assistant. She said, can you believe that? I was like, no. I said, so is it still there? <laughs> Don't know, but it was gone later because somebody believed in that ministry and somebody else pulled up that same day and put food in the box. And then I got an email from somebody else anonymously that said, I gave because I wanted to feed the hungry and we believe in the ministry of your church. Making the difference in the lives of others. That's just one example. Actually, that was three, wasn't it? I'm not good at counting. But thankfully, we have people in our church that are good at counting. And by your faithfulness in giving, we make a difference here and around the world. So as you go from this place today and you have the opportunity to give, our giving box is up here, our little church, as well as in your worship guide and up there, the QR code that you can scan. <clears throat> and you can uh, give online if you would like to do it that way or uh, anyway. So that you can support the ongoing ministries here at Anchor Park. We are, as a church, um, in our period of preparing for Charge Conference, which is our yearly time. Thankfully, we're at the very end of that. I made sure that we got like the last slide. So we got time. But uh, the opportunities are available. There's, there's positions available for ministry within the life of our church. Um, and uh, we are looking and praying right now about our youth ministry, uh, as well as for our finance committee. We've got great people there, but uh, I know some folks have, have stepped forward in other areas of ministry. And if something's on your heart and you would like to go and offer beyond financially and how you might serve here in the church, there are many opportunities, and I'd like to help you to find that. At this time, I'd like to invite Ken to come forward for our closing prayer as we go from this place of worship today. I invite you to stand as you are able for our responsive closing prayer that you'll find on the back page. God, be in our head and in our understanding. God, be in our ears and in our looking. God, be in our mouth and in our speaking. God, be in our heart and in our thinking. God, be at our end and at our departing. Amen. As you go from this place today, receive this benediction. Don't live by wishful thinking, but by faithful living. Keep your eyes on Jesus. In all that you say and all that you do. And go from this place. Do no harm, do good. Stay in love with God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Where's my mask?